Jeffrey, thank you very much for taking your time to, to do this uh, uh, debate. I, I was following uh, a lot of the things that you said, and what interested me is that these um, goals are not in the forms of regulations. You don't really deal with governments, that you sort of uh, deal with some moral calling. And in one of your uh, lectures, you said that it's surprisingly this actually functions better than if it be in the form of a government regulation or dealing with governments. Could you elaborate on that? Because that to me was, was, was quite fascinating, that, that these goals have a gravity of their own which sort of pulls by the heart. It doesn't pull you by profit, nor does it pull you by force in terms of regulation. We have to understand why the UN adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And in a way, they adopted them because the legal approach was failing. Back in 1992, the world agreed on major treaties on climate change, on biodiversity, and on fighting desertification, the spread of deserts. And they're really good treaties. They were well negotiated. They make a lot of sense. But then when they were reviewed 20 years later in 2012, the conclusion was, oh my god, nothing's happening. We have the treaties, but we don't have action. So at that point, one government, the government of Colombia, said uh, we need to make this more public uh, more visible, uh, more felt by business, by people in their daily lives. And they proposed that we have sustainable development goals that would be everybody's goals. So at least we would know together, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be fighting climate change. We're supposed to be fighting poverty. We're supposed to be fighting for social inclusion. It doesn't mean governments are off the hook, right. but it does mean that it's trying to broaden the way to actually make global change by making this a movement, not just a set of laws or diplomatic agreements. It's, it's funny because on, on, on the planetary level, we don't seem to have a single rule of operation. Uh, you know, and in, in uh, going to theoretical physics, uh, our friends there tell us that the, this planet Earth is about to transition from type zero civilization, which is local, political, and based on hatred towards the neighbor, hate thy neighbor, um, transitioning to, to type 1, which is planetary, and that we are, if I'm not mistaken, 0 0.87. They like to be as precise <laughs> as we economists. But what interested me in this as, as an economist is that it sort of comes nicely hand in hand with uh, what Keynes was prophesying about, you know, the economic possibilities of grandchildren, of our grandchildren, in which he says that about now, when we are also transitioning to type 1 planetary system, that the economy will no longer be uh, the whip, that survival will no longer be our uh, that thing that takes most of our time, and that we, and here I quote, will no longer need to elbow our brother in order to survive, but that mankind can finally do what it should have been doing from the beginning, which is arts, care for, care for our children, educate our children, dance, and enjoy each other's, uh, each other's um, uh, fellowship. How do you, do you think the time has come, or in, one, in how many years do you think the economy can really be put in the secondary, secondary position? And, and, and one last question that's related to this, how do you view the situation that people are much more interested in, or much more sanguine when they hear that there is a 4% GDP growth and, and no happiness when there is a 4% decrease in child mortality? So why, why this fetish? Keynes uh, wrote uh, that famous essay in 1930, in the, in the uh, depth of the Depression, uh, and he had the foresight to say, technology is improving, so by the time of my grandchildren, as you said, uh, the way he put it was, we will be at the end of the economic problem, meaning uh, the end of scarcity per se. And one could say for his country, the United Kingdom, or for the Czech Republic, or for uh, the United States or other high-income countries, it's basically correct, which is that, thank God, uh, as all of previous uh, humankind, we don't worry about the next day's food in the rich countries. We don't worry that uh, uh, dirty water is going to kill you the next day and so forth. What Keynes said, therefore, made sense and makes sense for his countries for the world as a whole, of course, one of the uh, most important facts of life on the planet is how unequal the planet is. So there are still places that are fighting for their daily survival, not just because of wars there, but because 
The poverty is so extreme that a mosquito bite carrying malaria can kill you. The water is not safe. The food is not preserved. There's no electrification. Kids are still dying of diseases that in the rich world are gone. So problem number one uh, is that Keynes was right about his own society, but it's not true of the world. Let's suppose that we solved even that problem, which is, in my view, completely feasible. And I wrote a book in 2005 called The End of Poverty, mm -hmm. and my uh, subtitle was uh, Economic Possibilities for Our Time, riffing off of Keynes's famous essay. Uh, so I believe that this could be a general solution. What Keynes did say, which sounds a little bit odd, but when you think about it, even there he had important truths. He said, our big struggle will be what to do with our free time. Uh, and at first you laugh at that because even in the rich countries, uh, people seem to be busier than ever and, and more crowded. But it's actually right in the rich countries. Part of the um, truth is that because of the advance of technology, we really do have a lot more leisure time. On an average day, according to the most recent data, an, an American over the age, 16 and over, works uh, three hours, 10 minutes. Now, what that means is that uh, only uh, about 40 some percent of Americans on a given day are working. Some are retired. Many are in school, some are, some are on vacation, uh, some are in prison, some are... Uh, pretending? Uh, yeah, some are pretending. <laughs> but we've already gotten to a point where right. fewer than half of the... But if you look a hundred years ago, everyone had to work. That was the only way to survive. So leisure is becoming more real. But another point that's very important that we're coming to realize, and it's, I think, uh, part of the gist of your question, Suppose the technology continues in the way that Keynes said. Suppose that the basic prosperity spreads even to the poor countries today, which is feasible. What will happen as work disappears? Uh, one vision is, well, we all enjoy more leisure time. That would be quite wonderful. But another vision is some people can't get any work and suffer because they can't get a job. And then on the other side, a few people who own all these smart systems end up uh, with wealth beyond imagining. And it doesn't take you too much imagination to say, doesn't that sound like Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, eBay, uh, Tencent, uh, uh, Alibaba, and so forth? We're creating gazillionaires right now who own these big networks. They've made such an incredible fortune billions, tens of billions of dollars for individuals, and then others are finding, we don't find work anymore, the machines are taking our jobs. So this is yet the next technology challenge. We know in history, every new technology creates new social conditions that create new political struggles, new divisions, and so on. It's an old idea, but a good one. And this new age of artificial intelligence and, and uh, smart systems is already creating big divides. So technology creates not only all the things that you mentioned, but I would also you know, fundamentally look at the new institutions that it creates. So one could even say that the, the social state or you know, caring state, let's call it, um, was a product of, of technological re re revolution that we had a couple of hundred years back. What sort of new institutions do you, do you envision um, and especially what interests me is, um, is things, is it true that the minimum income is really the only game in town? So mm -hmm. I'm not really asking about the yeah, minimum sure, because sure. there your opinion is quite clear, but yeah. what, are the other, what, are the other, what are the other options? What, how about fiscal policy that would not be state-centered, yeah. but that would be industry-centered for everyone? Why, why can't the car industry take care of the drivers that will be uh, left over, let's say? First rule uh, is that every technology uh, can be used for good or ill. So one of the absolutely real, it's every day in front of our eyes now, uh, points about the digital age is, are we going to go to all this leisure time and smart systems and happy life or are we going to cyber war? Hmm. Are we going to mass state surveillance? Are we going to uh, Big Brother uh, in the way that uh, Orwell could not have imagined. Right. 
Because that's absolutely possible. And we know uh, today there were more reports. We know these big companies are in cahoots with the National, uh, National Security Agency in the United States, the U.S. government looks on website activities, listens in, especially if an American is having a conversation or is looking at a foreign link or so. Uh, I know my calls, uh, any international call, I once said to a security expert, you know, I feel every time I make an international call, someone's listening. He said, you are so naive. At least six countries are listening. Well, <laughs> you know, I felt quite proud, <laughs> you know, but in, in truth. So that's one frightening uh, aspect. Uh, on the other side, you see, uh, and there was a wonderful news story today about uh, in Sweden, there uh, was a particular case uh, in uh, Spotify and some of the other high-tech firms, how the uh, work environment is becoming incredibly flexible for people to be able to pick up their kids and bring their kids to work or do other things to integrate family work time, more leisure time, and it's reinventing the workplace. That's a small fraction of uh, what's happening, but a very positive one in that it was saying it's creating much uh, more desirable lifestyles and so on. So I often view a place like Sweden as a leading edge of what's coming for the rest of us. Maybe it takes 10, 20, 30, 40 years to come. But I do think we could reinvent the workplace. We could reinvent uh, less time at work, more creative time, more caring time, uh, and uh, really rethink how we're going to live if indeed these machines are going to be as smart as, uh, as, as the uh, science geeks tell us they are. So, so I, I, uh, I was really impressed that the, the goals, um, sustainable uh, development goals, seem to have attracted a lot of artists and a lot of, a lot of people and there seems to be grassroots movement on, on YouTube and everything and I just heard a wonderful lecture by Bono on, on TED. Um, okay. uh, it, it feels all the way till today, I was trying to look for the meaning of economy. What are we growing towards? What are we running for? Otherwise, it's just a futile exercise right. that you're actually, you know, your body's in shape, but you never use the body to, to actually fight or run. You just run in circles. This seems to be something that finally, after thousands of years, mankind could have some moral, moral goal. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic with, with, because there are some good news in the numbers, some really, really good and right. proud news, it makes me proud to be man, or kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how are your emotions about the goals? I feel uh, every day um, several hours of angst, mm -hmm. a few hours of panic when I listen to Donald Trump, right. uh, and then uh, usually some good news uh, as well. Uh, so you just feel everything is in play. And I often quote uh, John F. Kennedy, who in his inaugural address, uh, this is more than half a century ago, said uh, that our times are different now. He said, for man holds in his mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And that, I think, is the existential reality that we could do incredibly wonderful things and we could do incredibly stupid, destructive things and so it's all in play. And so I'm basically like this every day, you know, from like optimism, great like news, that. and then, oh my God. <laughs> well, well I, was, I was to end on a, on a happy note, even though I'm going to catch you, catch you on, on, on Donald Trump. I thought that he made a wonderful Freudian slip of tongue in his electoral wish to make America great again. Here I thought to myself, well, finally, we have an, a non-autistic business person who doesn't only care about his profit, a non-autistic politician who doesn't only care about his constituency, but somebody who cares for the whole continent because there is no country <laughs> called America. It's the name of a continent, yes. So maybe we'll oh, live in the don't tell him the bad news. He would be so disappointed when but, he but got in started. This, <laughs> but in this Freudian slip of tongue, he was right. The only way how to make United States of America great again is to make America great again. So maybe, maybe next time we get to vote for a politician who will make the world great again. This is a wonderful point. Thank you for bringing some good news. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's be hopeful and, and really thank you for putting a lot of energy and I think you've inspired a lot of people, even my own company. They took it without me even mentioning it and, and they're following it uh, rigorously, with rigorosity that surprises even me. Thrilled to hear that. So it's thank you for a great interview. Thank you so thank much. You.